Hello, um, my name is David Scharf. I'm a professor of physics and the chairman of the physics department at Maharishi International University. And today I'd like to talk about physics and consciousness for the WAVES 2024 conference. So I am going to share my screen and start the slideshow. We have set up an Institute for Physics, Consciousness, and Veda at Maharishi International University. And in the course of this talk, I hope that it will be clear why we felt that was important to do. If anybody would like to uh, get in touch with me to discuss any of the topics further, here's my email address, dsharf at miu.edu, d-s-c-h-a-r-f at miu.edu. Now, <clears throat> Maharishi Mahesh Yogi founded MIU um, some 50 years ago, and he was aware that the material domain is just the tip of the iceberg of the comprehensive reality. And he wrote um, in his book, The Science of Being and Art of Living, the discovery of the field of this one basis of material existence will mark the ultimate achievement in the history of development of physical science. This will serve to turn the world of physical science to the science of mental phenomena. Theories of mind, intellect, and ego will supersede the findings of physical science. At the ultimate or the extreme limit of investigation into the nature of reality, in the field of the mind will eventually be located the state of pure consciousness. <clears throat> now, um, it's built in to the ancient Vedic tradition that um, contrary to what the materialist supposes, the mind is not just a passive byproduct of brain functioning. It's not just a byproduct of physical processes and from the Kata Upanishad, um, the chariot represents the body, the driver is the intellect, the reins are the mind, and the horses are the senses. And there's a similar theme in Western philosophy also, and this is Plato. The chariot metaphor is a familiar representation of the non-reductive relationship between soul and body. In his dialogue Phaedrus, Plato, through the voice of Socrates, uses the chariot to represent the body, pulled by two horses symbolizing the passions. One horse represents the noble, high-minded passions, while the other symbolizes the coarse, selfish ones. The soul, represented by the driver, is responsible for keeping the base passions in check, just as the driver has to keep the unruly horse in check in order to guide one's life successfully to enlightenment. This non-reductive conception in which the soul utilizes the body is in sharp contrast to the currently prevailing materialist paradigm in which the soul is a passive byproduct of neurochemical processes in the brain. And implicit in both chariot metaphors, the, the Vedic um, metaphor in Plato's, is the is information that is relevant to the current uh, disintegration that we're seeing in um, civilized society throughout the planet today. And it suggests an approach to resolving these problems. By strengthening the driver, the soul, enhancing and bringing to enlightenment and fulfillment, is the way to keep the coarse, selfish passions in check that we're seeing running rampant uh, throughout society, including Western societies, 
uh, which was a surprise to me. <coughs> the material domain is a small fraction of our consciousness, and um, it's just the tip of the iceberg. In the Tateria Upanishad, there are five sheaths surrounding Atma. Anamaya Kosha is the gross physical body. Prana, Pranamaya Kosha, or Prana is the life force which uh, nourishes the physiology. And Manamaya Kosha, or Manas, is the mind. And Vigyanamaya Kosha is the intellect. And Anandamaya Kosha is the ego. Now, Maharishi technology of the unified field, more commonly known as the transcendental meditation practice, uh, directs the mind inward, and one transcends from the surface level of personal psychology, where we're locate, located and uh, localized and isolated in the perspective of our body and what the senses give us on the world, the perspective the senses give us on the world, and it directs us deep inside to pure intelligence, and this pure intelligence is actually the unified field, which is at the basis of the material domain also, and advanced physics is discovering unifications, for example, of the four forces of nature, electromagnetism, the weak force, the strong force, gravity, have been combined in electroweak unification and the strong force incorporated for grand unification and we're working now on bringing gravity into the picture. Research on the transcendental meditation technique shows that subtler levels become accessible as one uh, transcends. Now in the 17th century the great geniuses who started modern science like uh, Galileo and Rene Descartes made a strategic decision to separate um, consciousness which at the time was very difficult to just to study in a scientific manner and the material domain which uh, was more accessible to the methodology of empirical science but there must be an interaction between the two because the mind obviously, consciousness obviously affects the brain and, and thereby the body. Descartes wrote, the mind is not immediately affected by all parts of the body, but only by the brain, or perhaps just by one small part of the brain. Every time this part of the brain is in a given state, it presents the same signals to the mind even though the other parts of the body may be in a different condition at the time. And he continues, the activity of the soul consists entirely in the fact that simply by willing something, it brings it about that the little gland to which it is closely joined moves in the manner required to produce the effect corresponding to this desire. He was referring to the pituitary gland, but it's more subtle than that and uh, more sophisticated. I probably won't have time to go into it in this lecture, but uh, feel free to reach out to me by email and um, if you'd like to discuss further. Now, there was a charming exchange of letters by an admirer of Descartes. Her name was the Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. She was only about 19 years old at the time, but very smart. And she wrote to Descartes and asked, Given that the soul of a human being is only a thinking substance, how can it affect the bodily spirits in order to bring about voluntary actions? For it appears that all determination of movement is produced by the pushing of the thing being moved, by the manner in which it is pushed, by that which it moves, or else by the qualification and figure of the surface of the latter. So she's asking, how can mind and consciousness influence matter which is governed by forces and um, <clears throat> that suggests a pointing towards a subtle energy physics which is why we have established an institute for physics consciousness and veda because progress in advanced physics we believe is not going to happen 
without incorporating consciousness. Now, Maharishi further described the process of transcending, and he explained quite clearly that the mind in samadhi, or transcendental pure consciousness, does not get extinct. I was thrilled when I read this in Godapada's Karaka so many years ago, that the mind in samadhi does not get extinct. It expands. Godapacharya says in his commentary on Mandukya Upanishad, Pracharasatu Vigyaya, the mind in samadhi expands, and thereby he establishes Brahmi consciousness, Brahmi Chaitana, not a state of transcendence, but a state of expanded awareness, thereby implying the practicality of action and behavior and experience. Very thorough and most profound in that state of Brahman consciousness where the mind is expanded, it doesn't get extinct, it gets expanded. The jiva becomes Brahm. Jiva is our personal psychology, our personal self, and this expands as a result of transcendental meditation and spiritual development towards enlightenment, towards Brahman consciousness, Brahmi Chaitana. It doesn't mean the jiva gets lost and extinct, but it only expands. It's the expansion of individuality, which is desired of the state of Vedan. Now, <clears throat> as physics has progressed, there is an accumulation of anomalies that suggest that the pillars of the materialist paradigm, space, time, matter, and causation, um, are crumbling, that they are full of cracks, and advanced physics is going to utilize these anomalies to bring about a deeper and richer understanding of science, including physical science. And that's what advanced physics at Maharishi International University is directed to. Now, everybody knows about entanglement. Um, Albert Einstein actually was the first one to realize that quantum physics implies entanglement between particles which may be uh, very far apart in space, that their, uh, it, their, their properties are correlating. And he called the spooky action at a distance. If you measure one particle of an entangled pair and you find spin up, the other one will automatically collapse the wave function and be detectable in the state of spin down. Not everybody realizes that this entanglement is also across time. And there's a phenomenon called the delayed choice quantum eraser, which indicates this which may be the basis of some supernormal or uh, psi abilities, such as precognition. Um, the anomalies in the materialist paradigm go back even to classical physics in uh, advanced electromagnetic theory. It has long been known that there is a radiation reaction that's when a charged particle, like an electron, accelerates. It, uh, an accelerating charge gives off energy. It radiates photons. And this radiation off <clears throat> has an equal and opposite reaction back on the accelerating electron, the accelerating charge. What's, what's surprising is physicists, the math is pretty clear about this. The acceleration may occur in the electron before the application of the radiation reaction force. Another anomaly has to do with the Aharonov-Bohm effect. Uh, even in the 19th century, as uh, you probably all know, um, electromagnetic theory, all electromagnetic field theory, can be brought into a coherent mathematical framework in terms of Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell's equations are framed in terms of the electromagnetic fields. Electric field, usually represented by an E, and the magnetic field, usually represented by a B. Now, the electromagnetic phenomena can also be uh, framed in terms of potentials, electromagnetic potentials. And these are actually simpler to calculate with. Um, but there are some anomalous effects of the potential formulation. 
For example, the advanced potential sends a signal backwards in time. Now, uh, this was thought to be just an artifact of the mathematics and that the electric and magnetic fields were what was physically real. So we didn't have to worry about this backwards in time business associated with the uh, advanced potential. But uh, Yakir Aharonov and David Bohm in the 1950s bringing in quantum physics showed that in regions of space where the electric and magnetic fields were zero, um, but the potential varied across these regions, um, a beam of light could be split and uh, passed through the different potential regions and recombined and the interference effects would show that the potentials were physically real even where the electric and magnetic fields were zero. This means there's a real anomaly here and there's a problem with our ordinary classical understanding of space-time matter and causation. Other phenomena are the measurement problem, collapse of the wave function, and um, what our uh, own university, Maharishi International University, and our president, John Hagelin, who is um, a, a distinguished quantum physicist, has developed the, what he calls the multiple storylines within one universal wholeness approach to the measurement problem. Now, entanglement is a manifestation, could be a manifestation of wormholes, um, um, paths carved out of the space-time fabric, and they could be shortened so that the far, far apart particles could be connected through these wormholes. Now, um, there is serious research. This is a study by Dean Radin um, showing that there is precognition, which seems to be built into the physiology. In this study, subjects were um, asked to sit in front of a computer and um, pictures, either having a calm content or an emotional content, were flashed in front of them. And if there was an emotional content, um, the uh, anxiety as recorded in physiological galvanic skin response would increase, whereas not in the case of a calm content. So a picture with a calm scene like a waterfall or flowers or trees or a beach would be a calm scene and there would be no galvanic skin response, but there would be quite a dramatic one in the case of an emotional or disturbing picture. Now, what was surprising, what Radin drew attention to is in the seconds before the picture was flashed on the subject screen, there was already a divergence in the galvanic skin response as if the phys physiology knew what was coming. So there are, um, there is much more to be discovered by physics and this is what we are working on at Maharishi International University, and we hope some of you will join us. Now, the, I'll just finish my talk by alluding to coming back to the theme of how to increase coherence in collective consciousness, which the world so desperately needs. And it comes from the Vedic tradition. These are Siddhas, they're advanced transcendental meditation practitioners, and they're doing their uh, TM Cities program in a collective uh, environment. They're doing it in a group practice. And what was found, there's been about 50 published studies replicating this effect. This is one of the early studies, uh, David Orb Johnson, uh, Charles Alexander, and a number of other uh, researchers showed that when group participants of the Transcendental Meditation City program increased, this is over a period of about six weeks, and the blue line represents the numbers of TM practitioners, that um, the collective consciousness as indicated in the quality of life composite index based on um, publicly available statistics the green line, they seem to be correlating 
that when the collective coherent group practice of the TM City program increased, then the quality of life increased as well. And this may suggest a way of calming world tensions and decreasing the disharmony that's so evident in the world today. So I'll conclude my talk there. Please feel free to reach out to me. Again, here's my email address, dsharf at miu.edu. I'm the professor and chair of the Department of Physics at Maharishi International University and the director of the Institute for Physics, Consciousness, and Veda. Thank you so much, and I look forward to hearing from you and uh, carrying on the dialogue further. Best wishes. Namaste.